From Microbe TV, this is Twin. This Week in Neuroscience, episode 49, recorded on March 4th, 2024. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the nervous system. Joining me today from New York, Tim Chung. So, hi, everyone. Um, nice to be back. Suffering from a little bit of technical difficulties and also physical difficulties. I have quite a bad cold, <laughs> so I might be kind of wheezing and coughing throughout today. Um, you should just come to the incubator to record. Oh, to incubate further. You know, it would <laughs> take you 20 minutes to get here. Oh, yeah. I, I should come visit. It's Yeah, I should definitely come visit. Um, and then you could have really nice... I just need to find a like a two hour stretch during my day that I can pop out without okay. being yelled at. <laughs> also joining us from New Orleans, Vivian Morrison. Hello, long time no see. How's how's New Orleans? Is it uh, hot as anything, or is it mild? Um, today it's uh, today it's rainy, but it's and it's like not too hot. It's just super super moist. Mm. Um, this is like the birthplace of that word, moist. Moist, humid, but yeah. It, yeah, it was uh, straight up hot the other day. It was like eighty degrees, but um, here it's thirteen C and cloudy in New mm. York City. So it's pretty crazy weather. It's, it's a little bit warmer. It's, it I was, was bundled it, up. I think this two morning. days ago it is about zero, zero Celsius, which is when ice freezes for people who are into Fahrenheit. Um, and then, <laughs> and then the day after it was ten Celsius, which is temperature of a pleasant run and then the mm. day after it's 20 celsius which is almost getting to summer weather so I, this is not a nice trajectory over three days that we want okay so i have a potential title for today's episode and then i will hand it over to tim who's going to talk about the paper mirror mirror on the wall who's the fairest mouse of all haha ha, i like that one <laughs> that is a very good one but what is that about, Tim? What am I talking about? <laughs> Sorry, my mic is uh, my mic is going a little bit nuts. Uh, Vincent, I believe you're talking about uh, Snow White. Oh, that's right, of course. Oh, <laughs> um, yes. Uh, I don't know whether mice would ask the same, exactly the same question. Um, yeah, who knows? I would what like to see the seven dwarfs of the seven mouse dwarfs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> little beards. Especially, I think I have a few grumpies in our, in our colony. Um, anyway, so uh, today we are going to talk about a paper that I have to admit, um, I am not, an ex certainly not an expert in, but it's very intriguing to me. That's why I picked it. Um, the, it is all to do with the concept of the self. Um, so let's go right into it. The title of the paper um, is visual tactile, oh, I'm sorry, the title is quite long and I'll break it, I will go into it, but the title is visual tactile integration facilitates mirror-induced self-directed behavior through activation of hippocampal neuronal ensembles in mice. So that basically mm. is the whole paper summarized in a sentence. Um, Which is what you want. Exactly. The title, done. right? Um, <laughs> and See you next month. Exactly. Like there are, there are, there are maybe more figures than number of words in the title. Um, <laughs> the, it, it's by uh, the, the first author. There are actually three, author, three authors. So I'll just say say all of them. First author is Jun Yokose, uh, and also uh, second author is William Marx, and the last author is Takashi Kitamura. And they are based in UT Southwestern um, in Dallas. It is in Dallas, yes. Um, and the paper is published uh, 2024 uh, in Neuron. So let's quickly unpack the, the, what the uh, title of the paper is about. The thing that we're going to talk about today is um, whether mice... Well, whether mice have a sense of self, whatever that means. It's actually quite a uh, <laughs> nebulous concept, to, even for me, just to think about. Um, so 
as I don't know whether you disagree, Vincent, but I would say maybe as early as life's as early as life's formation, inception, what, uh, conception, whatever, like in, back in evolution of time, uh, the idea of self is very important. Um, as early as maybe not quite as early and in the as in the RNA world, but very soon afterwards, I'm guessing, um, life forms started forming things like membrane to separate itself from the environmental mm. world to pack uh, to mm, that's separate deep, itself. Yeah. That's a that's, that's an real interesting deep. way to look at it. I well, like. That. I was thinking of immunity? looking in a mirror and saying, "That's me." And I have a spot on my face. Ah, yeah, we will go. We will go there soon. But the idea, <laughs> but in biology, I think as soon as you have things like um, a her, kind of a, bi a physical substance of biological inheritance, such as uh, DNA and RNA, um, yeah. organisms through evolution start having these um, kind of barriers to separate myself from others uh, in the environment, partly for regulating um, just so that you can regulate what goes on inside me so that I can propagate my genetic material better. Um, but soon it evolved to something much, much more complicated. For example, uh, in humans, we have a very strong sense of self, so strong that I think it's kind of like the air that we breathe or the water that fish swims in. We don't even think about it too much often. And it's very hard for us to imagine uh, when we don't have a sense of self, actually. Um, and I think if I'm no practicing of any Eastern religion or philosophy, but a lot of what, even though I'm from the East, but I'm just, uh, <laughs> I guess I'm just bad at those things. Um, but a lot of the focus on those religions is to achieve of like, you know, ego dissolution so that you can be more at one with the universe, that kind of stuff. Um, so it's very inherent. We're designed to see the world uh, through the eye of the self. Um, and it's very kind of difficult to get away from it. But what's interesting is that, an interesting question is that, how about not just humans, but other life forms, other animals? Um, do they also have, a sense, also have a sense of self? Uh, if yes, what is their sense of self like and how can we test it? Mm -hmm. um, so this is what today's paper is going to be about. It's the sense of self thing is very, yeah, it's, I don't know how to think about it because like I said, I don't think about it very much being not really being religious, but I think Vivian I think mentioned, you, did you mention the immune system might be an interesting way of thinking well, about it? Well, I mean, we use the word self and, you know, like self and non-self. Um, exactly. That's like that. Like the rec, rec like recognizing that something is a, a path from a pathogen mm -hmm. uh, or mm -hmm. recognizing that something is from yourself and um, tolerating mm -hmm. it. But I think yeah. that the sense of self and identity, self awareness is actually a lot more about, or it involves other people and other agents to um, a larger extent than maybe you're letting on because. As in this paper, they show that the that um, the presence of um, another person, well, in this case, a mouse, and particularly one that looks the same as the mouse that they're testing, is crucial um, for the development of of what they are calling self sense of self, self of self identity, and self awareness. Mm -hmm. And but they also say there's a couple of sentences that I underlined that are. They kind of break it down. They kind of take um, this idea away from the kind of lofty um, explanation that you were giving it of like sense of self and break it down as like a visual representation, a lasting visual representation of your physical being um, from the from some other perspective. Right, right. Which is weird to think about in a mouse. Because, like, that is essentially, it's like saying that the mouse is put, could put itself in another mouse's shoes, <laughs> um, which, you know, that seems very, very much like human. But, um, but I think if you were to go deeper into that idea, you know, it might kind of fall apart and we'd see that it, that actually 
probably exists to varying degrees in other species like they even talk about mm -hmm. that it's not like all or nothing you either have a sense of self or not or you either like ha have behaviors that demonstrate that you do or not depending on if you're um, a higher order or lower order primate or maybe a dog or something like that there are different characteristics of this kind of larger broader um concept mm -hmm. of self-awareness that can show up in those different um, situations, in those different contexts with different animals. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly right. So I think the visual, rep stable visual representation that one can have of oneself and then use that to direct your behavior, that's really what it comes down to, mm. in my mind. Yeah, I, that makes sense. The I wonder, I don't, I'm just thinking about this like on the fly, but like how... Like for example, if you if you put on makeup or let's say you put on like a mask, um, how much do you lose a sense of smell? Uh, sense of not sense of smell, <laughs> <laughs> sense of self. Um, but I guess that's mm. why I like you know why actors sometimes you know transform when they put on makeup and stuff like that. But um, or do um, method acting? Or just yeah, just just exactly, just live the mm. just live the just live the life. But I. The sense of self must not be just purely visual because people who are blind also have, you know, a sense of self. Actually, a sense of self probably goes, it's important for having a, you know, sense of self for many things, not just visually. And in fact, I can, one can imagine having a visual sense of self is difficult to picture how that evolves. For example, like, Mice don't have mirrors to look into. Uh, we didn't and we have didn't, mirrors. Yeah, exactly. Humans didn't have mirrors. We might have like <laughs> streams that you can gaze into to see the reflection back. Um, mm -hmm. Every like every now and then. Well, a mouse could look at it, a mouse could look at itself in a stream then. Potentially, but I have no <laughs> idea whether that even in the cage wall. <laughs> Well, I mean, in nature, I'm thinking. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but like, if you live in the desert, <laughs> yeah, if you're like that's a, real sad, right? If you're like a desert, a desert mouse, then you, I mean, I mean, you might never see, uh, you might never see the reflection ever. But or, maybe it's because of kin. Ah, you but know? you were just like you were talking about heredit, like the the passing down of certain traits. Right. Like, and, why do you even need to um, develop a sense of visual self? And yeah, I mean, as, uh, assuming that you're you're heard looked a lot like you which exactly you is just you not know. how is not how it is now for most modern humans though right that's true that's true um but we that that's something that we might get into i don't know and humans might be difficult mm -hmm. um but yeah uh the, but for the sense of self there are other son, kinds of sense of self that is important for one to develop for example you can imagine a much more kind of adaptive sense of self would be let's say i'm like s walking through the jungle and i suddenly hear like a, a twig snap um it would be very important for me to know did i cause that for example like did was i just moving and i stepped into something and snapped the twig or was i perfectly still and i hear a twig snap because in the first case i probably should be a bit quieter and a bit more careful in the second case it might be because i'm being followed by, you know, a lion or a bear or something, and I should be not very careful and just run as fast as I can. So things like this is quite important to have a sense of, you know, did I do something? Did the did the outside world do something? Um, whereas for the sense of self in terms of if I see a mirror, is it really me? Is it someone else? You can imagine that might be less, it's less obvious uh, why that would be important. But nevertheless, uh, researchers back uh, apparently around 50 years ago during the 70s, a researcher called Gordon Gallup um, designed a task, came upon this task where at first, he's actually, I'm not sure about the full history of this, but one of the tests that he did was to uh, put a mirror in front of chimpanzees. So chimpanzees are, uh, I think, uh, uh, line of, I don't know whether it's family, kingdom family, which genus, species, but they are basically the animal that is closest to human, closest relative to human. And he found that when he put a mirror in front of chimpanzees, um, they have some 
they de- they show some behavior that suggests they might have a sense of self. For example, they would, um, well, at first, what they do is they look at the mirror and they freak out a little bit and they th- treat it as a conspecific. They treat it as it's a different chimp, a chimp that they have. Because they, um, chimpanzees live, they see other chimps unless you socially isolate them. Um, chimps would see other chimps, so if you put a mirror in front of them, the first reaction they, they, you get is that the chimp think of it, respond to it as if it's another chimp. But soon, they, the chimp in front of the mirror would start doing kind of interesting movement as if it's testing what the chimp behind the mirror, so to speak, the chimp in the mirror is doing. So it would start moving around, and then it would see the chimp in the mirror also doing similar stuff. And by doing this mirror exposure, the chimp seems to get a sense that the thing in the mirror is actually itself, perhaps. It is, chimp in the mirror is doing exactly what the chimp itself is doing. <clears throat> and when you get that, uh, the chimp would start doing behavior that is very odd that you normally never see in chimps that have not been exposed to a mirror. For example, apparently according to, so I'm uh, going, w- I have to shout out not just the paper that we're covering, but a, a kind of like a perspective paper by Christian Cases and Frederick Michon, I guess, I'm probably butchering uh, names here. Um, they wrote a perspective paper in Neuron that explains all this background that is super helpful to me because I know very little about this. Um, but according to their perspective, uh, chimps, when they have mir- when have they been exposed to a mirror and got used to the reflection, they start actually um, use, they start to use the mirror to explore body parts that they normally cannot see themselves without a mirror. Mm. For example, they start, you know, grimacing, checking out their teeth. You guys were talking about teeth early on during the pre-show. <laughs> yeah. um, apparently, they start picking up food out of their teeth, just like humans when you have spinach stuck in, uh, in between your teeth. Um, so <laughs> researchers take this kind of behavior in front of mirror as some evidence that perhaps chimp also have self-awareness. But... but- only 50 per didn't it say that only in that that perspective article that only 50 percent of the chimps do i think that? so yeah it's mm. not every chimp which would show i think it. is not awesome. every chimp would show it yeah um so which which uh which is an interesting uh which is an interesting idea that the sense of self might need to be developed as we would see today uh, in the paper also I don't I don't know where you'd find this, but I think we assume that 100% of the human population also has a sense of self, but that can't, I doubt that that's true because like, I think, um, well, I just don't know if it's true. Well, I think it's well, maybe that- a risky assumption. So maybe it's actually not that strange that only um, some portion of the chimps actually have, have it, have that sense think, of self developed it- enough to do the task depends whether you have reached enlightenment and if you have then <laughs> no no i mean no, i was joking um, i mean I'll, <laughs> yeah no i know that would that would be that would be great yeah. if, it, if that was the reason that people didn't have it but no i was thinking about um p- potentially individuals with autism hmm. um they mentioned in the either the perspective article or maybe the main article itself that the sense of self emerges in human children around the same time that empathy and embarrassment emerge mm-hmm. and empathy um i you know a um somebody a psychologist psychiatrist or somebody a scientist who studies this might um tell me that this is a um that i shouldn't do this but you know empathy and, and theory of mind so being able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes mm-hmm. um are either the same thing or very closely related and theory of mind is um thought to be underdeveloped in individuals with autism mm-hmm. And so, um, and you can see this in their, in behavior and social interactions. And so I wondered to what extent um, the sense of self um, or some aspect of the sense of self is underdeveloped in those individuals too. Yeah. So I'm not saying that 50% of the chimp population, that the sample that they tested are autistic, but I think it begs, I think it, it begs the question how, or it, it should make us pause and think about what does it mean? How the how what what portion yeah. of our population is truly? But I think you aware. you you hit upon the crucial task as a scientist, the most one of the most difficult tasks as a scientist, um, 
that we have to face, which is we sometimes come up with a concept that we think is very obvious to us, like the sense of self. Um, and then the question is, well, how do we assay it? How do we, how do we, mm-hmm. what tasks do we have that we can use to test it? I mean, it's like, um, it's kind of like similar to asking whether an artificial intelligence is is conscious or has acquired general intelligence. Can it pass a Turing test? And then people debate about the Turing test. Can you know? Does the artificial intelligence fool you like a human would? To uh, to get a sense of whether a thing, an organism, has a sense of self, we have to de- devise, come up with a task that we agree might assay the sense of self and that's what the i really like i really like what they used right exactly so that's what the researcher gordon gallup came up with uh, not only did did he put a mirror in front of chimpanzees and make this observation about um you know self self behavior that chimp has um the the critical test that he came up with is a test called the mark test um i don't know whether listeners might have heard about this and this test is you put a, an animal that has, you know, got used to the mirror in front of them. Uh, you put this animal um, in front of the mirror, get them used to it, and then it, under some situation, you would put a mark on the animal on a place that they can't see. And usually the mark is put on the forehead um, So because your eyes cannot see your own forehead. Um, and this is often done under under anesthesia so that the animal cannot feel you putting the mark on. Um, once you put the mark on, now you put the mirror in front of the animal and you observe what the animal does. And what uh, Gordon Gallup saw was that chimps that show all these self, you know, checking out its own teeth, kind of all these behavior that suggest they have a sense of self. They are the chimps that tend to see the mark on the forehead and then they would try to rub it off. They would kind of do what is uh, called a mirror-induced, mirror-induced self-directed behavior, which is in the title. So we just covered maybe one third of the title. Um, <laughs> um, so the, according to Gordon Gallup, this might be an assay that uh, researchers have been looking for to test whether an animal has a sense of self. Um, if you stick a mirror in front of them and they rub it, uh, they see the mark and then they try to get rid of it, they rub it, they might rub it and then smell it to see, you know, what is this thing that is on me? Um, The humans would do the same thing. I I don't know. I've seen some very dirty kids. uh, (laughs) Well, also, have you, I was going to say, as I I was thinking about this, constantly, you know, I'll be like, to my kids, be like, you have something on your cheek and they will touch the cheek that's not on their right, for example, but it's the mirror of theirs, so they touch their left cheek. Mm. Oh, so they get so they haven't been mirror exposed enough, I guess. You know, I'm okay, okay. with that. <laughs> but but what's interesting is in the I think either in this uh, perspective or maybe in the paper, um, I read somewhere that children fail the this. So this is called the mark test when you mark the organism and then put a mirror in front of them and see if they kind of have any movement towards the mark. Um, children fail this until maybe two years of age. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't know whether that has anything to do with theory of mind, like whether that comes on as theory of mind comes on, which is can they put themselves in the perspective of another person, that kind of stuff. I think they actually can do this. So I think it's um, a gradient. I, like when in the perspective piece of the main, and I'm sorry, I keep forgetting where, which of these papers I've gotten this information from, but um, that like, certain animals will do certain components of the kind of uh, constellation of behaviors mm-hmm. um, that are associated with the, um, with the mark test. Um, I think it's the same thing for humans. And at very, very early ages, um, an infant can be watching somebody, you know, do something um, like a, you know, some sort of behavioral assay and they can, they will also, they, they can like, I don't know what the word is, but detect surprise, for example. Uh, okay. Hmm. The, like, there's, but I don't know if that's like the, if that's more of like a mirror neuron thing uh, that, or if it's like the child also feels surprised. Like, I don't know if you can. 
You can't, it's like with mice, you can't ask them if they're surprised about no, something. We have, yeah, we have to assay them. And then the question then yeah. becomes, is the assay, is the assay any good? Is it telling us the thing that right, we're, validity. We're, we're testing for? So let me, let me mention something you asked earlier. So in terms of phylogeny, uh, the, um, the chimp in hu is the closest to Supposedly, humans, the closest relatives. And then the gorillas are next, and then orangutans, gibbons, and then old world monkeys. So the reason I mention that is because they've also used uh, macaques, which is an old mm -hmm. world monkey, and they fail this. Um, exactly. Mirror exactly. Test. So, so <laughs> a range of so across the across the animal kingdom, um, I think what the researchers call hominids, which are basically chimps, and mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not a animal person, so I really know. So I think <laughs> apparently chimps are hominids. Um, I think chimps are the maybe the one of the few ones. No, actually, at the beginning, the researchers found that chimps might be the only one that can pass this test without any sort of extra training. So if you um, get chimps habituated or exposed to a mirror for a while um, and then put a mark on the head, they would try to interact with the mark, suggesting they have this self-awareness, at least a, a large proportion of chimps would. Um, so hominids are humans and chimps and, chimps and gorillas and pongos, ah. actually. Yeah, so they're uh, eight no species in four is. genera. <laughs> Except for the, isn't that the name of one of the Dalmatians? <laughs> From 101 uh, Dalmatians? Well, I've probably it's the covered dad's every name. single name possible since they're 101. <laughs> um, but so at the beginning, um, the reason why this test was interesting is because we thought, oh, we found the test that only a few of us can pass. Only humans and our closest cousins, the chimp. And even things that are slightly further apart from us in the animal uh, phylogenetic tree, like macaque monkeys, they don't pass. But as it turns out, um, as researchers kind of uh, do more and more experiments and do more studies, they found out that under certain circumstances, even macaque monkeys can pass. So mm. in macaque monkeys, if you... Um, if you put a mark on the face that they can't feel, for example, a laser. So if you put a laser dot, like, like an annoying child, you put a laser dot on their face that is of very low intensity. So they can see it in the mirror, but it doesn't, it doesn't irritate them. Then they just ignore it. But if you put a stronger laser, laser light on the face uh, that is of a high enough power that they causes some irritation, the monkey would start touching it and you can train the monkey to basically touch its this pointer that they see on the face uh, that they can also feel because it kind of maybe irritates a little bit. You can train it with some food and then eventually you can take away the food mm. and just show a low power laser and the monkey would start touching its face and follow the mm. point around. And when they start doing that, then all these kind of hosts of behavior start emerging like they start checking weird body parts that they normally can't see as well so this raises the possibility that the sense of self might also be seen in monkeys given if you motivate the monkey enough with enough training um and that it might be learnable and what is actually makes this even in the most ridiculous perhaps ridiculous extreme is that a few years ago, researchers found that there are these fish, fishes, fish. Oh, yeah, I There's saw that. There's this fish that lives, uh, uh, I'm guessing, in the sea that is called cleaner fish. And the job is to go around looking. They actually have an occupation. What they do is they, they are fish. That, there are other fish that come visit them. And these other fish are usually have some sort of parasites or like dead skin cells growing on the gills and hanging off. And these cleaner fish would go around eating the parasites and cleaning it off them. So their job, the cleaner fish's job, is really to look for, visually look for kind of mm. marks and wow. weird things on other fish and then eat it off. That's cool. And these cleaner fish are a very cool story. They're very social and they often work in teams. But in these teams, there are certain cleaner fish that are kind of cheaters. And instead of cleaning the parasites, they like to take a big chunk and eat the client. They would bite the client to try to eat, oh my get, gosh. like get some food good out cop, of the client. Bad cop. And then the, the good cleaner <laughs> fish that are honest workers 
would get very upset and they would che- they would find these cheaters because when a client fish get you know got a chunk eaten out of them the client fish goes away they get a and bad they don't, yelp they don't come back they just leave uh, they take the business elsewhere so the good cleaner <laughs> the honest cleaner fish would would be able to identify the cheetah fish oh my God. and chase them around and t- like you know they would behave in a way as if to dis- you know to yell at the cheetah fish to punish the cheetah fish so that they don't do it again so they are very social um, they are very social animal mm. these cleaner fish and they're also Amazing. very visual because they have to identify both you know where the parasites are on the clients and also which mm. of their teammates are cheetahs and they and researchers found that if you paint like a big mark on these cleaner fish, they would also act as if and then put a mirror in front of them. They would also act as if they can see these marks, so they would try to rub it off on like the riverbed or something. Hmm. Um, and that raises Amazing. a huge question: Are we trying? Are we now saying that even these fish have a sense of self the way we have a sense of self? If we go by this mark test that um, that scientists use. By the way, Tim. Uh, orang- uh, the pongo is an orangutan, okay. which is one of the f- the four closest to humans. Uh-huh. Right, we got humans, chimps, gorillas, and then the orangutans are the farthest. So all of those are considered. Oh, hominids. I see, and they pass the the mark test. Wow, they do. That's they interesting. Do. Yeah, that, I mean, these guys. The one common, quite. I'm guessing the common theme here is that these um, hominids are also social and also visual um, beings. The question is, do they feel sh- ashamed of the, you know, <laughs> empathy blob and, on their empathy head? Because I think, well, that's another question, right? I yeah. thought even cats feel ashamed, like if they do something very silly, like try to do a jump and then fail, they have this like shameful the walk of shame away. Well, there's know. there's plenty of evidence for that. Right, exactly, Instagram. exactly. Totally. We need a, we need a test. Totally. We need a similar <laughs> embarrassment. Yeah, I was going to say the next step up here is to expose the cleaner fish to social media and see what happens. <laughs> exactly. Um, anyway, getting back to the paper, we've, we've gone on for quite a while on this, uh, on this high track. But yeah, Jason would now be yeah, saying, I have, Tim, get yeah, on I with know, the data. Even, even <laughs> Paper. Yeah, but the you know <laughs> listeners they want to hear it. But they the, want to hear this stuff. Yeah, yeah but this is I the like this is really the context. And thanks a lot to the Keezers and Michon uh, perspective. This is like what they talk about, so that we have some context about what this kind of uh, this assay for testing the cell. Um, so in this paper, the the researchers took a bold step into the unknown and asked the question: How about the humble mice? that we all use in, well, most of us use in neuroscience because of you know, how easy it is to use mice. We have a lot of genetic tools. These mice who, based on kind of stereotype, kind of lab law, we think mice are you know, blind, three blind mice. They probably don't have a very good visual system. They can barely see. Um, that's being challenged. Mice actually hunt. They go around and see, like they would hunt crickets if they see like insects. They would you know, pounce on it and, and grab it. So they definitely have good vision. Well, maybe not perfect vision, but they have some vision. Um, the question is, do these mice, uh, humble mice, that are so different from us, so far apart from us, but we use a lot in neuroscience, do they also pass the mirror test? And if yes, what bit of the brain uh, is involved? So to get at this, finally, we're onto the paper. So in figure one of the paper, these researchers took, I'm guessing, quite a bold step um, to actually try to test the mirror test on, uh, to, to do the mark test on the, on, the, on the mice. It's one of those things that I think if you submit in a grant, it will probably be rejected straight away. Uh, Why? Because the reviewer would just say, <laughs> surely not. Um, but they did it. Yeah. Well, but they it, did it. Just, they can eat their yeah, shorts. Ex- exactly. Uh, <laughs> so what the reviewer, uh, sorry, what the, the reviewers, <laughs> what the researchers, the what the scientists did <laughs> was first they uh, habituated the mice to a mirror. So in the mirror test, you have got to put the animal in front of a mirror so that the organism would, you know, play around, not quite play around with the mirror, but, you know, maybe do some weird movement in front of the mirror to, to, to learn that the thing in the mirror um, is, first of all, a conspecific and second of all, potentially the movement mimics your own let's say you know this this is interesting because i often pick up my dog and 
try and get it to look at itself in the mirror and it won't. Ah, docs fail the, the mark test completely, apparently. If it doesn't I feel look like at it, it just but, weird, but, right? Have uh, you tried to show your dog like your, a picture of somebody on the phone? Like like yeah. ch like children or grandparents or whatever? And it's like well, some, Sometimes they will watch TV, I think. But, mm. but um, maybe mm. that, that's what this habituation is about, to get them used to a mirror. Do you know, right? But if a dog has never seen a mirror, do they... Do they freak out in front of a mirror? No, my my I, dog I I've held up nothing. multiple oh, times. But that maybe they're habituated. So as we see in this in the first figure, mm -hmm. mice actually habituate. At the beginning, maybe. they respond and then they habituate. I ask because I have I have walked dogs before, and I know a dog can s maybe they can smell it, but they can sense a dog a block away and start. You know, pumping themselves yeah, up. Well, that smell. I'm sure that smell. Potentially. Yeah. But they, they start, you know, getting those, themselves psyched for a fight. That's all <laughs> yes. um, Anyway, so in this, uh, in this experiment, what the uh, scientists did, research, researchers did, was they first habituated the mice to a mirror. So they have a box with a partition in the middle so that it has two rooms. And one of the rooms has a mirror uh, at the end, and the other room has nothing. And they put the mouse in for 12 days. And they find that. Um, mice would naturally prefer the side with a mirror. And what's more, they tend mm. to hang out close to the mirror. So they would spend more time mm. next to the mirror. Fashionistas. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> These mice are so vain. Um, actually, one of, I mean, if... But wouldn't, wouldn't they do the same thing if it was like, instead of a mirror, it was another mouse? That's true. They will do, they do the this, same thing. Would they, they do the same thing? They absolutely do the yeah. same thing. So maybe they just like company. Even, even when it's themselves. <laughs> um, but what's interesting is on the first few days, five days or so, uh, when the mouse is in front of the mirror, um, so obviously these mice never seen mirrors before, the reflection on the cage, you know, notwithstanding. Um, they, for the first few days, they would do a lot of rearing in front of the mirror. So they would, you know, stand at the mirror um, quite a lot, which... I think mice, when they see another mice, sometimes they also rear. So maybe this is just a reaction of what they do if they see another conspecific. I'm not sure. Um, they also didn't, the, the type of rear means something different. So I didn't, I saw, I don't know if you went into their supplement or anything like that. But I did not, but they didn't, in the main article, didn't talk about, didn't specify whether it was supported rearing, which is the mouse going up against a wall and like touching the wall or, or if uh, it's unsupported mm. rearing. I didn't, I didn't because, go that deep. Um, yeah. Well, I just thought about it because, um, in the lab that I work, we have to think about supported versus unsupported rears because one of them, I believe it's the unsupported rears is indicative of ang is, is considered an indicator of anxiety. Uh. So, um, I just wonder, I was just yeah, like, oh, that I don't know. I, I, I imagine it was. I imagine it was supported, like they're going up and exploring the the mirror. Uh, potentially, um, yeah. I didn't. I didn't check. Although, if you are rearing right up against a mirror, I don't know, like how, how the whether it would be too close for the mice to see itself. I don't know what the focal length of the lenses are in that. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> that might be a little too uh, deep for this <laughs> podcast episode. Anyway, the mice uh, tend to, at the beginning, when they first see the mirror, they would rear a lot close to the mirror. But what is interesting is that um, as they become more and more habituated, as time goes on over the 12 days, this rearing behavior actually declines, um, uh, which is an interesting observation. And also, this actually, in some way, mimics what um, kind of chimpanzees also do which is at the beginning, they do a lot of testing uh, of their own movement, or at least researchers interpret that as testing the, the movement in the mirror. Mm -hmm. And eventually they can habituate to it. Um, and then every now and then they check for food in the teeth. Um, so these mice would habituate. Mm -hmm. And once they habituate to the mirror for 12 days, then the researchers took the same mice and they start doing the, the mark test. So they've done a bunch of very clever um, control tasks, uh, control manipulation. For example, they um, looked at, so the focus is uh, what happens if they put basically a blob of ink on kind of the forehead, but it, if you look at the picture, it's almost like 
the entire top of the head as well. Um, uh, I'm guessing you can't, because the, the way the mouse's face is, they don't have quite a big forehead, so you have to go to the top of the head as well. Um, so what they found is that <laughs> if they put a big dollop of paint on a mouse's head and stick the mouse in front of the mirror, then they start grooming the head much more. And what's interesting is that this uh, grooming is directed to the head, you know, where the paint seems to be, and not directed. How do they else. rule out that? How can they rule out that they don't feel the paint on their head and they're just... Oh, uh, no, they, so, they show that you actually... That's, that's the first word of the paper, visual tactile, yeah. because they do something with black exactly. versus so, white. So in chimpanzees, the, I think the paint might be uh, kind of light enough so that the chimp likely don't see it. And I think if you do it with a laser pointer where they can't see... Uh, where, where they can't feel it, and if you do it with a laser pointer when mm. they definitely cannot feel it with a low enough power, they still have the mark test. Um, with the mice, they first of all they found that this kind of self-directed grooming, it doesn't. It happens a lot less if you turn the light off. So it's not just by feel. Mm. You also need to see it, um, mm -hmm. and it also happens a lot less if you remove the mirror. So the t these are two okay. um, evidence that suggests the mouse has to see its reflection before it does it, but. If you compare a mouse with this big dollop of ink um, on its head to a mouse that has not has no dollop of ink, and you look at how much they groom the head without the light, there's still a slight elevation um, in the dark mm. uh, when you have the ink on the head. And in fact, if you put uh, instead of white ink, you can put black ink. And these are black mice. These are C57 black mice, which is a most uh, common lab strain. Um, if you put a uh, ink that matches their coat color so that they call it in the researchers call it the invisible ink um yeah that i was like what? it's not really invisible ink it's how just can black. it be invisible <laughs> it's just um, black it's not lemon juice on parchment um <laughs> no. uh, if you put black ink on the mouse's head on these mouse head um they still groom they still have a slight uh, slight tendency to groom more um but when you switch the light on, it doesn't groom extra more. It doesn't further increase um, the grooming. So there are two... Comp oh. And then what is also interesting is that if you put a very small mark, a small white visible ink on the mouse's head, they, and then you turn on the light, this small spot of ink does not trigger any increase in grooming. However, if under the small spot of ink, you put on a big dollop of black ink that is normally invisible and then you put on this small drop of white ink, and then you turn yeah. on the light. Then this turning on the light and the mouse seeing, in front of, seeing itself in front of the mirror will trigger more grooming towards the head, suggesting that the mouse actually has to integrate both some sort of tactile sensation on its head caused by this big blob of ink, and also the visible mark that it can see. I think... Um, I would like to see an, another experiment on here where they like bleach the, so what bothers me about this is that like they can't dissect apart, um, the weight, the tactile component of the blob from like the size of the white mark. Mm -hmm. Like you said, they have to, in order to, to stimulate the, um, to stimulate the grooming, they have to have like a certain amount of ink, and then you can achieve the same results with black ink, provided there's a small right, white right. dot. So like you said, integration, but it would be nice if they had another condition that was like the same kind of area um, is white. So like bleach or mm -hmm, paint. Mm -hmm. Um <clears throat> But that doesn't have that weight, doesn't have as much that tactile mm. yeah. component, that somatosensory component. You're really taking the mouse um, to the, to I, the hairdresser like to... if you start bleaching its hair. Uh, yeah, I know. But the, the downside is it might <laughs> smell. The so they, 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 the researchers work hard because mice are very smell-driven animals as well. So they say a lot about the ink being right. smellless. But you could... But but you could also then have as a control be like this is the bleach room <laughs> or whatever where like the the odor is introduced to the animals or you know whether they to both both the bleached hair and Highlights. the non-bleached hair anyway yeah uh, I I guess I wish that we could rule out like to what extent 
Because here they they really it's can't difficult, but completely remove the I, I think tactile to, component. To one thing that researchers can do in the future, if they really want to get to the bottom of this, is um, is to have lasers that track the mice, so that they just or like a light spot that tracks the mice, and have some way of kind of in kind of separate mm. way of triggering some sort of um, some sort of tactile sensation. Not quite sure how. Right, and you could probably use play around with the intensity as well as the wavelength so that you could like make sure that the kind of the energy, the yeah. heat sensation that the animal's getting from the light would right, be equal. Right. Um, I don't know of anything about mouse vision and color and stuff and how that might mess with it, but anyway. Yeah, but, I, but the review, uh, the scientists, the researchers point out that the requirement of some sort of tactile sensation to pairing that with a visual, you know, mark that is very similar to what the macaque needed for them to start passing the mark test. So maybe it's something that the mice have to learn. And it might be, you know, does it have the motivation to even scratch if it just looks a bit... Maybe the maybe mice are a lot less vain uh, than we originally thought. Maybe it doesn't mind if there's a mark there unless it feels some sort of irritation so that suggests it should brush it off. Um, so it's... it's uh, un it's unanswered right now, but for the purpose of this experiment, the researchers found that they can get the mouse to pass this mark test, provided the mice can feel a little bit of something that, that causes it to scratch, uh, to kind of groom itself. But um, even if you, in the condition where you uh, paint a, uh, a big dollop of black ink and above it you paint a tiny bit of white, a white ink, so the mouse really is going by sense the feeling of the of the mark as opposed to the visual stimulus. The increase uh, of grooming you see when mm. the mouse is in front of the mirror is much much less than the increase in grooming you see if the whole blob of ink is white. So vision does seem to do play play an important role here. In any case, um, so so the mice seem to park these pass this mark test with some caveat. So what the reviewers, uh, what the researchers next wanted to test was what did the mouse had to go through for it to pass the mark test? Can we identify some of the elements that the mice had to had to go through, had to learn, so that it can pass the mark test? So the first thing they tested was um, what if uh, instead of a mirror that you put the mouse in front of, instead of putting the mouse in front of a mirror, during the mark test phase, if you put the mouse in front of a transparent screen and behind the screen is another mouse that has a mark on its forehead. So basically, it's a different mouse that has a mark on the forehead. Its movement is completely not correlated with your own movement because it's not a mirror anymore. Does that trigger any self-grooming? And they found that it didn't. So. Uh, it shows that the self-grooming really requires a mirror, not just a mouse that looks like uh, looks looks like yourself, uh, but with a mark on its head. Um, I like the name for that. Oh, emotional the... emotional contagion. Ah, exactly. So oh, that's yeah. one of yeah. the reasons. <laughs> one of the things that um, the the researchers try to rule out is that emotional. apparently, I did not know this, but. Uh, I don't know why it would be emotional. I, it's just visual. Yeah, I feel like it's like when somebody yawns exactly, or like exactly. when somebody goes like this, uh, you do exactly. that too. So, so this it's is, more this like... Is behavior. It's, vis it's visual it contagion. behavior. Right? Mm -hmm. Oh, the, the yawning can mm -hmm. be triggered by audio, I think. Um, it's visual behavior mm. that... By this podcast, you think? <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think you get the award for the best joke um, of this, of but this session. It's, uh, it is uh, basically behavior that is infectious, that... That is well, mm. not necessarily viral, but it passes along uh, from person to person. Um, and the most obvious that we know of is yawning, and it happens with humans. I think probably monkey, uh, probably other. Let's not talk about okay, it anymore. Before, before I'm we trying to be like, pass am I gonna, out, am I going to yawn? Um, but in mice, <laughs> apparently, um, several behavior can show emotional contagion. What is known, what what researchers call emotional contagion? For example, itching. So. If I'm a mouse and I see uh, a conspecific mouse, like a cage mate, start itching, that increases the chance that I also itch, even though nothing has been done to me. <laughs> um, another thing is 
if in my cage mate, I'll come specific, is in pain, that increases my pain sensitivity. So they, these are, and we don't fully know the full mechanism. Like, is it because the original, my friend that is in pain is kind of scree kind of yelling in ultrasound, using ultrasound. Ultrasonic to, uh, exactly, vocalization. Ultrasonic vocalization is, you know, sounding it's upset and that upsets me and makes me pay more attention to pain. We do not know. Um, but the researchers wanted to rule out that it is not this self-directed uh, grooming behavior triggered by the mirror and also the white ink is not just caused by my cage mate or a conspecific, have conspecific having a white ink on its head because we're really trying to probe at the essence of the concept of self here. So it passes. If you, if you instead of a mirror, uh, instead of putting a mirror in front of you when, when you have an ink blob, if you have a, a mouse friend with an ink blob, it doesn't cause you to groom yourself more. And another thing that is interesting, uh, another control that's interesting that they did was if you, hab if you don't habituate the mouse, if you uh, take a... So remember earlier we talked about um, the, the re researchers spent 12 days uh, habit putting the mouse without any ink on its forehead, just the normal mouse by itself in front of the mirror. And at the beginning, the mouse reared a lot. And then later on, the mouse stopped rearing. If you take away the mirror so that the mouse does not see itself um, and then just straight away put the mouse to the mark test where you put an ink blob and then stick the mouse in front of the mirror, the mouse does not pass the mark test. It does not increase its grooming. Um, furthermore, instead of the mirror, during the mirror habituation, um, instead of the mirror, if you put the mouse in front of the transparent screen watching other mice, um, it also doesn't pass a mark test. So if you habituate the mouse not to a mirror, but just to a window of other mice, so it can't test any of these, you know, when I rear, the thing in the mirror also rears. If it doesn't do any of these, it also doesn't pass the test. Even though if I remember, even though if you have a, you know, a conspecific, conspecific mouse behind the window, um, when that happens, the mice actually rear a lot. They still do the rearing. And in fact, the rearing never habituate. Um, so if you have a friend behind a mirror, you guys just keep rearing at each other all the time. They never habituate because maybe the, it's less boring than just watching yourself in the mirror. They keep interacting. Um, if you do that, the mouse didn't learn. There's something that the mouse has to learn during the mirror habituation so that it would later on pass the mark test. If it's a different mouse, it doesn't later on pass the mark test. Um, and then what is... I think potentially the most interesting is that if you raise the mouse by itself, so once the mouse is weaned, so the, you separate the mouse from its mom after it's nursed enough and the mouse can be independent, if you socially isolate the mouse uh, for its adult life and then do this whole mirror habituation and then this mark test, the mouse do not pass the mark test, um, which is quite interesting. It needs some exposure to conspecific, it needs to see other mice so that maybe, you know, mm. in, a, in a very wishy-washy way, maybe by seeing other mice, it has in its head an idea of a black furry blob. And then when it sees another one of those in front of the mirror, it just says, oh, it's one of these furry blob I've seen before. And it just happens to move the but way I move, something like that. And in, uh, in support of this kind of wishy-washy hypothesis, if you have, if you, so we're working with black mice here in the mark, uh, in this whole test. If these, if you take up the black mouse and instead of socially isolating it after weaning, if you put it in a foster home, but the foster home is full of white mice, so these mice don't look like you at all, but you are now used to seeing these white mice. <laughs> um, if you put this mouse in the foster home full of white mice and then uh, put the mouse in front of the mirror, for, do all this mirror habituation and also the mark test, this black mouse will also not pass the mark test. It does not groom more. So it really suggests that the mouse has to experience both conspecific that looks like the thing in the mirror and also the mirror itself before it would park the mark, uh, pass the mark test. Um, so this really starts, allows you to, um, mm. allows the researchers to start kind of kind of uh, breaking apart what 
the necessary components are for you know an organism to pass the mark test at least if the organism is mouse not sure about you know a cleaner fish that kind of stuff um i just want to make a small uh, small interjection here which has to do with um with social media and how there seems to be i don't i haven't read an article on this and i don't know if people use this word but it there's an increase an increasing amount of young people who have like depression and anxiety and I would suspect that some of that some part of those um, mood disorders or um, states has to do with some dysregulation or dysfunction of self awareness. I don't know. I don't know in what way. This is just kind of like a gut feeling thing. But um, if there is some sort of fracturing of one's sense of self or one's identity because of mm. repeated exposure to a much larger and much more diverse population of people um, and like much more frequently than we normally would be exposed to. I wonder if that if, if there's some some kernel from this paper that could then, you know, lead us to think about, well, what's the mechanism by which, because people are like, oh, social media is like a big problem for adolescents. And um, so I wonder if there's some kernel from this paper that can be taken to try to understand the mechanism by which social media usage then leads to a fracturing of self-identity and a development of um, yeah. depression and anxiety yeah. and ultimately suicide. I, I, I think you're onto something because I think social media gives you the ability to see far more diverse population of humans than you would otherwise, right? You would just see your own circle. Then you can see all kinds of people, and you may say, I wish I was like that and like that and like that, and I can't be, and get into an envy thing. And So there's something yeah. there, yeah. yeah. I think the difficulty yeah. is, is translating it to, if you want to study it in an animal model so that you can get to the neural mechanism, I think that would be hard because of the translation. But for like, yeah. so something yeah. like this experiment, um, so if you have a black mouse surrounded by white mice, we do not know if the... From the perspective of a black mouse, everyone else, everyone is white. From the perspective mm -hmm. of a white mouse, everyone is white except for one black mouse. So do they treat the black mouse differently mm -hmm. because of that? We don't know. We're getting into some weird yeah, social yeah. commentary here. <laughs> um, well, I, I will just say that there are groups, there are, uh, there's like, I was working with some Alzheimer's disease model mice, and every mouse in that cage was a different color. So I think there's some other, like, Com some other like Rainbow conditions Nation. in which you could have like where it's like everybody is an individual uh, you yeah know? actually um, that's a that's an interesting point like what what is the mouse's sense of self in that case is yeah i mean if if you're the black mouse in a white mm. cage does do you feel targeted are you going to feel targeted Somehow, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know anything about <laughs> aggression between different mouse. Studying, lines. studying like uh, <laughs> prejudice in mice. I think that would be a <laughs> well, quite a research yeah. project. <laughs> anyway, um, but, but yeah, so so you require they require exposure to mice that look, look like, like the them, things. and then also the mirror habituation to yeah. pass. And the in fact, test. what's interesting is like if if during the mirror habituation, like when you stick the mouse in front of the mirror for twelve days, um, if the mouse has never seen it's uh, it's been reared in social isolation or it's been reared foster reared with a other uh, with a bunch of white mice um and then if you stick that black mouse in front of a mirror they never habituate they always rear for throughout the 12 days unlike the mice who eventually who were reared with uh, conspecific of the same color uh who eventually uh, passed hmm. the mark test so there's something going on that is interesting yeah, that's something that There's something weird. going on during the mirror exposure, as researchers think, also for chimps and other 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 organisms that pass it. Um, all right, so we're running out of time, so let's go right through to the neuroscience. So, the, so in summary, uh, researchers found that mice, under this visual, tactile, sensory um, condition, they can pass this mark test. So the next question is. Does any is it associated with any brain changes? Did any part of the brain light up when a mouse sees itself in a mirror, or when a mouse uh, passes the mark test? So what the researchers did was they basically just hab habituated the mice, and I think in some conditions 
they uh, uh, they made sure that the mice uh, have passed the mark test. Um, so they have a sense of self. If you uh, if you if you buy the story of the mark test, as saying sense of self, and then they do one final day of exposure to just the mirror. So they have mice that are they have two groups of mice. One group of mouse is um, put in front of the mirror uh, with white ink, and then a different group of mice are put in front of the mirror with black ink, and then they. Uh, euthanized the mice, and they looked at the brain, and they specifically look at this marker of recent neuronal activation uh, called FOSS. So FOSS is, we talked about this in the show before, uh, FOSS is a workhorse for um, for labeling cells that's recently been active. So cells that fire tend to, um, cells that fire tend to turn on a lot, lot of um, secondary signaling molecules inside the cell, and these uh, signaling molecule can go into the nucleus and turn on certain genes. Uh, some of them are called immediate early gene that turns on very quickly and then turn off very quickly. One of them is FOSS, and you can look at the, you can do a manipulation and then euthanize the mouse and then label for this protein FOSS. And any brain region that has more FOSS would suggest to you that that brain region might have been used during the task that you were tested just before you euthanize the mouse. And when the re researchers did this, what they found was that they saw increased false expression in the medial prefrontal cortex, uh, which is important for executive function, uh, quote unquote. We won't get into that. Uh, but also in the hippocampus, uh, which is an area that is very important for, most famously important for a uh, sense of space. So that is where our GPS system is, where the play cells are, but also memory. So uh, patients, uh, a very famous patient, patient HM, had uh, the hippocampus or the medial temporal lobe, like where the hippocampus lives, and they had it cut out due to uh, epileptic seizure, and the patient HM lost or was unable to form new memories, so they got anterior grade amnesia. Um, but researchers have increasingly found that hippocampus is important for social interaction, like remembering which individual is an individual. Um, uh, and also for other kinds of social interaction. So it's interesting that uh, hippocampus actually turned on when the mouse saw itself in front of the mirror with a giant blob on its head. Mm. Um, the researchers then asked the question, um, this group of neurons that get turned on when a mouse sees itself in the mirror, um, if I put the mouse in front of the mirror again, does the consistent group of neuron light up? So are these neurons specifically tuned to when I see, when I have a visual input of myself? Um, so the way they get at this was they used, uh, this is a little bit trick to, tricky to explain, but I'll try my best. They used a system that allows the researcher to Instead of FOSS labeling, FOSS basically, if a brain region has been active, the FOSS would turn on uh, within an hour, and then it would turn off, turn back on within a few hours. Um, that's why it's an immediate early gene, comes on and off. But um, what researchers can do is actually they can put in a FOSS promoter. So the reason why FOSS turns on is because the FOSS promoter itself um, got turned on, transcription factor came into the FOSS promoter and start transcribing the FOSS gene. Um, and if you put a FOSS promoter in front of a fluorescent protein, like a, in this case, the researchers use a red fluorescent protein, um, the FOSS promoter, you would turn on the FOSS promoter and the FOSS promoter would then make this red fluorescent protein uh, with a special condition that you can, there's an extra switch that, um, the researchers can do to specify the time window when you want this red fluorescent protein to turn on. So if you basically give a drug or take away a drug, let's say you give a drug doxycycline, um, if the mouse is on the drug and the mouse's brain region has recently been active, then the FOSS promoter will then be able to transcribe this red gene. Um, and the time window allows you so that, you know, you don't want, if, the time window makes a, allows the researcher to really specify when you want this system to 
you know, tag the neuron that's been recently active. Otherwise, you know, the mouse, you know, might get into a fight, you know, on a on the morning of your experiment, and then you would label all the brains, all the regions of the brain that is involved in fighting. What you really want to do is basically only open up the time window um, close to when you're doing the experiment. Um, so when they do this, they can label on day one, they use this red fluorescent protein to label the group of neurons that are active on day one. And then these neurons would become red and you would see them later on. And then on day two, they can close this time window again. And on day two, they would then put the mouse into a different condition. And they would ask on day two, the cells that are active. And now we can assay on day two, uh, either using FOSS or a different immediate early gene. And in this case, the researchers use ARC. It's complicated. But ARC is also a different immediate early gene and is uh, Jason's favorite, let's assume, because Jason works on it. Um, <laughs> you, can on, you can label on day two which neuron has been active by looking at which neuron contains ARC. And you can also ask a question, which neuron was previously active on day one by looking at the red fluorescent protein that was made during day one. And by doing that, the researchers basically um, uh, found... Ooh, I skipped... Actually, you know what? Very briefly, I skipped a bunch of um, experiments that they did, but they show that if they um, they used chemogenetic, they basically inhibited uh, the hippocampus, both ventral and dorsal hippocampus, which is two regions of hippocampus. And they were able to identify which sub-region of the hippocampus that is important, that if you inhibit this region using chemogenetics, which is a way of sp specifically inhibiting certain cell types, um, if you inhibit these uh, sub-region of hippocampus called CA1, you can block this uh, block this mark test, suggesting you know further verifying that the hippocampus is important. Um, but once they show that you know causally that if you inhibit the hippocampus, you can block the increase in grooming when you have a mirror in front of the mouse. Then they went into this kind of ensemble labeling, and they were able to verify that if you tag um, if you tag the ensembles on day one that were activated by uh, putting the mouse in front of a mirror, then on day two, you put the mouse back in front of the mirror, then, there's, then they found there's more overlap of these two days' neurons. So it suggests basically that the, t the two population of neurons activated on day one and day two show more overlap if the mouse are exposed to the mirror on both days, suggesting these neurons might be important for a sense of self. However, if the mice, uh, if the mice were never exposed to mirror habituation, or if the mice were reared in social isolation, or if they were reared with white mice, so basically mice that failed a mark test, and therefore supposedly we hypothesize they do not have a developed sense of self. If you label the, uh, if you label those cells in, instead then the overlap is much less. Um, so if you have mirror on day one, and then, uh, yeah, exactly. If you basically label the, the, put the mice in front of the mirror, so you label the putative self ensembles, but the mice didn't get a good sense of, like didn't develop a sense of self, the overlap is much less. Um, so this really raises the possibility that these, uh, these neurons might have something to do with sense of self. But surprisingly, what the, my, what the researchers found is that if on day one, you label the putative self-recognizing neurons, and on day two, instead of putting a mirror in front of the mouse, so it is the same, you know, it is the same procedure, so it will be the same self neuron that is, you know, activated. Instead, of day, instead if on day two, you put a conspicuous on conspecific, a black mouse, but behind a transparent screen, you still see some overlap. So what that suggests is that these neurons that get activated in the hippocampus might not be specifically for detecting self, but it might be for detecting both self, but also other components that look like self, such as another black mouse. So it raises the possibility, um, the 
the researchers in this paper suggest that it raises the possibility that these neurons in the hippocampus, um, that the you might have different populations of cells that are important for different aspects of this mirror, uh, this mark test. Mm. And these cells in the hippocampus might be important for, you know, this... Uh, you might have different gradations of sense of self, and these hippocampal neuronal ensemble might be important for the visual component of something that looks like you, but not necessarily 100% you. And then in the very final uh, figure, these reviewers, instead of just looking at the correlation of these ensembles that are activated by different conditions, you know, is it a mirror on both days? Is it a mirror on day one, but a conspecific on day two? Um, the researchers now tested, um, they use this uh, ensemble system. So once again, just to remind our listeners, uh, they use the FOSS promoter to tag the cells that are active during day one. And in this experiment, instead of the activated gene being a fluorescent protein so that you can look at it later on and try to see if it overlaps with a day two ensemble. If this gene is now a recept, uh, kind of a designer receptor that would inhibit the cell. So now the researchers are trying to ask the question, they're trying to, are asking the question, if we inhibit the same neurons that are activated during day one, um, can we block the mark test uh, in a subsequent day? Um, and what they found was that indeed, if, the, if on day one they show the mice a mirror and they label those cells using this system, using this uh, neuronal tagging system, and on day two they inhibit the same neurons, then they were, uh, then on day two, sorry, in on day two they inhibit the neurons and then have the, mark t have the mouse perform the mark test. Then inhibiting the same these kind of uh, neurons that were activated by the mirror on day one can impair the performance on on during the mark test on day two. It's a little bit. I'm messing. It's a bit hard to explain what's going on. But basically, on day one, you you label the cells that are activated by the mouse watching itself, and therefore activating this putative self ensemble. Mm -hmm. And then on day two, you inhibit these same cells. And when you do that, the mouse is less good at doing the mark test and grooming its spot. Uh, whereas if on day one, instead of putting a mirror in front of the mouse, you put a transparent screen in front of the mouse and behind the screen, you have white mice. So mice that look nothing like uh, the mouse itself. Then if you tag those neurons and then later on inhibit those same neurons uh, while the mouse is doing the mark test, then the mouse can still do the mark test. So it suggests that on day one, whatever neurons is tagged when the mouse is observing a bunch of stranger mice that it's never seen before and it doesn't look very much like itself, it does it labels a population that wasn't a self kind of uh, a self associated <laughs> neuron or self recognition neuron. <clears throat> Excuse me. But interestingly, on day one, if Behind the transparent screen, you have now mouses, uh, black mice, so conspecific mice that look a bit like yourself. And then on day two, you inhibit the tagged neurons. Then what you find is that if you do that, if you inhibit those cells, it would once again block the mark test. So what it suggests is that the hippocampal neuron ensemble activated uh, is can be activated by either seeing uh, a mirror image of yourself or um, a visual image of mice that look a bit like you. So Tim, for that middle condition, so it's a mouse exposed to uh -huh. white mice, and then the next day they do the um, mark test. And I thought you said that they passed the mark test? Uh, but I would have thought that they. Oh no! So these would, are my. Sorry, are they, these are, are mice. Or are these mice? Sorry, they're mice so that did these the are mice that are reared with uh, black mice. So they are completely. They, okay. did, they previously okay, cool. did the mirror habituation. They previously parked the mark test, and then on the day of tagging, 
when you're trying to find out in the hippocampus, I'm trying to um, re-trigger mm. this yeah, self, yeah. Uh, a self-triggered, self-recognition triggered yeah, neuronal yeah. pool. Um, if I then later inhibit the same neuronal population, can I block marker? So instead of using your mirror yeah, to trigger it, it's a you, trigger weird. The, you trigger a different population. Maybe nothing goes on in the hippocampus, we actually don't know. But if you stick the mouse in front of white mice, stranger mice that it's never seen before, then the putative self neurons do not reactivate. And the evidence is that when you later inhibit these pull of neurons, it doesn't affect your marked test performance. Gotcha. Um, so gotcha. that's really quite interesting. That, so that really does suggest that the hippocampus um, has neuronal ensembles or neuronal population that is important for a sense of self but they are also activated when you see a friend when you see a conspecific that looks like you so it suggests it partakes in some sort of visual element of the sense of self and we don't know um you know if you label if you do the same thing and you're trying to label neurons but the mice has never been mirror exposed before so it hasn't learned its own self so there's some learning involved, obviously. If it hasn't learned its own self, but you just you know expose the mouse to a mirror and label the neurons, uh, that or just expose the mouse to its friend and label the neurons, and the mouse has never seen a mirror before, um, does it still uh, later on impair the mark test? The presumably no, but those are some of the questions that are still unaddressed. Um, but that was pre that's pretty much the paper, I think. I don't think I missed too many. Well, I, that that's hugely abridged version of the paper because we spent quite a bit of time talking about the background. But um, in a nutshell, that's the paper where they, we now have a grasp. What, we sh what the researchers showed that is that the mouse can pass the mark test uh, under some condition. It requires exposure to a uh, social conspecific that has to look like your mirror image. Um, and also seems to require the hippocampus, specifically the ventral hippocampus. Um, and what the hippocampus might be doing is it might be involved in recognizing either yourself or conspecific that look a bit like you, that shares features as the thing you see in the mirror. Um, and if you lose that, you are less able to groom away the mark that is bugging you on the forehead. Um, so this allows, so this actually, the reviewers, sorry, the researchers uh, um, raised the point that it's actually surprising that mice can pass this kind of test. And it raises the possibility that mm -hmm. this uh, mark test that um, Gordon Gallup came up with 50 years ago, instead of an all or none that we talked about earlier, um, you know, even in humans, it not, not, might not be all or none. And especially if you work across the animal kingdom, um, you might start seeing uh, kind of the different organisms would, pa would pass this test under slightly different condition. And it might give us a window as to uh, what, like what are components are involved in, in, terms of like new, in terms of the neuroscience, which bit of the brain is required. And also it might also tell us a little bit about when we have this idea of self, what actually goes into it? What does it mean? Is it just mm -hmm. what I do? What under certain situation, the collection of behavior that I would exhibit? Or is it also what I look in the mirror? Um, so all these are woven together to give us a sense of self. Um, so Tim, if, uh, if fish can pass the test, why are they surprised that mice I think they are very pass. surprised that fish can pass the test. I don't know whether they're surprised that mice can pass the <laughs> test. I was certainly surprised. But that's before I read that fish can pass the uh -huh. test. Well, maybe it's, you know, I don't know. Maybe it also has something to do with, like, but the, what the, the, the fish... So that's... The, the fish's purpose in life is to sense these, like, high contrast <laughs> items or whatever and clean right, them right, off. Right, right, right. Exactly. So, so I that's... Mean, like, sorry. Well, I... You, you, like, Tim, like Tim said, there are conditions for different species. And with right. the fish, they had to do ecologically relevant masking, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And for the mice... In fact, they say, they, they say in the discussion that the the mouse uh, response is really different from primate, right? They they need a lot of cues where the primates right, don't need right, a lot right. of cues ahead yeah. of time. So mm -hmm. they say maybe this 
we cannot, as a consequence, understand the deeper phenomenon mm -hmm. of self-awareness <laughs> in mice. That's true. <laughs> I like, um, one of the things that um, I would love to see further developed here has to do with a paper that we discussed a long time ago, like more than a year ago, because I was still in Nashville when we did this. And I can't remember which paper it was, but I, I feel like we, we, we talked about like the smell of a banana and that there's a particular yeah, yeah, yeah. ensemble That's of the neurons drifting, that... Uh, that yeah. Right. Mm. And so yeah. I, I'm Imprinting. thinking about like the stability of this representation um, and whether like how stable is it? So if we took these mice and then aged them for some period of time, would they require like a kind of repriming, you know, or like what if you, you had this mouse that passed the mark test? Per, you know, it's great. They grew up with their mice that just look, look like them. And then they spent the rest of their lives mm -hmm. with white mice. How would that interfere with their ability to pass the test? And then how also might that change um, the activation, the reactivation of these neurons? Um, because neurons are pretty stable. I don't, don't actually know anything about the, like, how quickly these um, fluorescent markers that they use uh, degrade or turn over in the cell. So I don't know like how long you would actually be able to mm. detect the cells that at the, you know, very first time the mouse did the mark test were activated. And if you could see like, where are they yeah. now? <laughs> you know, like six but months I think, later. I think all these um, But I think it would be relevant because like the way we look changes a sure. lot um, on many different time scales. Um, and the way that the people around us look changes a lot. So, but yet, and so then like, is our sense of self stable or does it, it might, also yeah, change? Yeah, exactly. That's, that's completely true. So that would be really, a really cool thing to see them do is kind of, because they mention it somewhere in here, I think, um, like a critical period uh, uh, uh -huh. for this kind of mm -hmm. development. And mm -hmm. I don't think they, they don't, um, they haven't gone deeper yeah. into that here, but you know you can't do everything in one paper. But um, I think it's this is I really liked this paper. I enjoyed it. So the, in the commentary, they they make a nice point. They say, you know, how how well do mice know themselves? <laughs> they don't self-explore, and they require big marks, um, which are different from primate from hominids. And so they say that hominids have a unique motivation to build an explicit vision motor representation. So that's yeah. interesting. Mice might mm -hmm. just not. Yeah. Motive. It was interesting. They use the word yeah. motivation. I, that's the yeah. thing. Like it's, we do not know what is required to get these animals to pass the mark test. And in fact, when the, when the, I think when the fish paper came out, when they realized fish can also, these cleaner fish can also pass the mark test. Um, I think there was a publication in the Atlantic, uh, where someone raised the question, you know, if fish are passing this mark test, does that mean fish have a sense of self, or does that mean the mark test is actually testing something completely different <laughs> and we have to think about what we're doing? And I think it's still completely under debate right now. We we do not know. I think I think um, the last thing I'll say about this is I wonder to what extent this the like the strength, like the motivation to build this representation of oneself and then to utilize it to understand our own behavior, yeah. others' yeah. behavior, how they yeah. see us, and then to react. And it's this kind of like chain of back and forth and then um, uh, reacting to whatever's happening around you in a particular way. I wonder to what extent it's related to um, kind of societal structures. Like, for example, like we know that in primates, like there is a hierarchy mm -hmm. Um, there, there have been papers that look at that have just been like, and this one is this, you know, the the alpha, and this one's the beta, and mm -hmm. all of that. And you mentioned earlier about the cleaner fish that there's a kind of there can be an aggressive relationship between team between two individuals that are part of a team. And I don't know to what extent that happens in um, in mice. I think they don't know if they have a well, very dominant strong mice. There is okay. But I can I can imagine a situation where like it would be really important for um, like we you know mice can be pretty mm -hmm. darn aggressive I think we've all seen that um, either in our own experience or heard about it from other scientists um, but also like with hominids that also it can be extremely aggressive and ultimately lead to like mm -hmm. death right so it would be extremely beneficial to be able to like get a really good sense of 
how somebody else is perceiving your behavior and then to adjust. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, based on like, is this going to yeah, get yeah. me killed like whether, or not? Yeah, like whether something... When something so, happens in the world, did I do it or did someone else do it? If it's yeah. if it's someone else, maybe and there's I nothing it, I can do about it. If it's me, I, yeah. I can do it and I can shape it in the future. That's obviously yeah. important. And I think it, another interesting step of this would be to see to what extent having an, an aggressive mouse mm. be part of that uh, aggression. And I'm, I'm thinking, as this relates to humans, I'm thinking about trauma. Mm. You know, um, if the person you're learning from, if you're a caregiver or parent, um, is it generates trauma, how does your development of sense of, mm -hmm. of self, um, how is that different? Because yeah. um, that's also a problem yeah, later on unknown. in life. That's unknown. It, Lots of interesting yeah. stuff. I, yeah, but it's, cool. it's weird that I, like, very final note, is I couldn't, fun like, I could not for the life of me, and I think the, uh, uh, I think people who work on the Mark test also suggest that if you try to look for an evolutionary uh, advantage of being able to pass the Mark test, it's quite difficult to find. Like, like mm -hmm. animals out in the wild very rarely see them their own reflection. Um, so this Mark test might just be a some sort of window into a very particular, a very narrow window into the sense of self that is very visual, very visually uh, mm -hmm. specific. But yeah, I could not think of a, any evolutionary reason to wow. know that um, to know that something is my body versus something is other per people's body, except for uh, if you like, if you see a mosquito, let's say on your on your, ha uh -huh, on your that's hand, exactly what I like was you thinking. would instinctively, <laughs> if you see a mosquito, so it's a mark on your hand, you would slap it. Or if you see it on your your on your your, your on your face, somebody right. sitting Imagine next to you. Imagine the same situation, but you're sitting next to Mike Tyson, and the mosquito lands on Mike Tyson. Mm -hmm. So then you really need you really want a good sense of self. Otherwise, you just slap Mike Tyson. Well, I was I was thinking of it as like you know if you see a, a parasite on your you know monkey or on your you know if you see if you see something like a mosquito or whatever on something that looks just uh -huh. like you like somebody that's part of your tribe oh. you know then it's like that could be on exactly me. and yep. you know could yeah. i have one on me because i look just like mm -hmm. you and you know i mean obviously nobody's explicitly think the animals are not explicitly thinking that with those words yeah. but yeah anyway that's it thanks that's it. thank you thank that you that's great it's really cool i like i guess you could Call this behavior. I think it's absolute behavioral neuroscience, neuroscience in the way. Uh, mm -hmm. and the tr yeah. the difficulty is turning. Be we, it's basically taking the mouse to the opera, but instead of to the opera, this is to like I don't know the weird hall, yeah. fun house hall of mirror, and use that use that <laughs> to make uh, to make some sort of hypothesis all the way to the sense of self, which is really a far away hand wavy thing to think about. I mean, if you look at, if you Wikipedia self-awareness, it's like 80% philosophy. So can we get a handle? Can we get a handle <laughs> of this scientifically? It's quite uh, difficult. Point. And I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, the point is to get the under, the, the um, cellular underpinnings yeah. of these behaviors, right? To understand what neurons are involved and but, how, But in, right? in addition to what neurons, so they, getting, to figure out which bit of the brain is important is, I think in some sense yeah. almost secondary to getting the right behavioral task to get the thing that you want to ask. And mm. that's not the hard thing. Mm. Of course, the brain is also mm -hmm. the most complicated things, one of the most complicated things we have to work, we're working on. So that's also hard. So, But getting the right assay is important. It's, it's, it's all in the assay, exactly. That's mm -hmm. it. You have, your, you have the assay that works, and you're in Hershey heaven, as we say. I don't know if you know I that actually reference. Know, I actually know, know that, uh, that reference. I don't. Al Hershey and Martha Chase, they they had this assay where you would take virus, attach it to a bacteria, and then in five minutes put them in a blender to shear off the phage. That was their assay. And they used that for years to get all kinds of different results. We call oh. it Hershey heaven. Yeah, but <laughs> oh, we actually have gosh. the same okay. in behaviors. We're running over time. But things like for the longest time to ask the question, does this, we have a drug that might work well as an antidepressant. 
does it really work well as an antidepressant? We'll test it in an animal and we have assays mm. like we we'll put the mouse in a bucket of water or a rat in a bucket of water and see how long it takes them to give up struggling and swimming. This is called a forced swim test. And on face value, it doesn't seem like it has anything to do with depression, but uh, scientists use it because it is, we, we have mm. learned to, we, we have used it as an assay and it has stuck. And I think there are questions about whether it is, you know, a valid test. Should we have other tests, other, other way of testing if a mouse is depression? So th this is an ongoing, uh, definitely an ongoing theme in neuroscience is how good are our assays. Yeah. Well, thanks for that uh, paper, Tim. It's cool. Mm -hmm. um, that is uh, Twin49. Show notes are at microbe.tv slash twin. If you have questions or comments, twin at microbe.tv. And if you like these programs, we'd love your financial support. It'll be federal U.S. tax deductible because we're a nonprofit corporation. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Tim Chung is at New York University. Thanks, uh, Tim. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for listening. Um, I hope you guys, yeah, I hope oh, you guys I enjoyed, enjoyed it. It, it was much. a fun one for me because I know so little. About I learned a lot. It's such a wishy-washy topic. For <laughs> me, these are all about learning. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. Vivian Morrison's at Tulane University. Thank you, Vivian. Yeah, thanks, guys. This was awesome. I'm hoping, I think I might be up next for presenting potentially or in, in the next few episodes. And I'm actually thinking about doing something that builds Ooh. upon this. I think it might be, be interesting cool. to kind of be like, and here's something else that's related. April 8th. It's a Monday. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. You've been listening to This Week in Neuroscience. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month.